happens on as a fait accompli should not live up to the dream. The grain flowed at Cargill's and the sheep ran at Wilson Foods. It was pretty much a day as usual in eastern Iowa agriculture. Wilson Foods and Dubuque Pack told me animal receipts today were normal, although for Iowa and southern Minnesota as a whole, they were only one half of what they were last Wednesday. And the story here at Wilson's, the farm strike as the non-event of the week, well, that story was repeated all over eastern Iowa. The comments were no impact, no change, no effect at all. Car deals had a booming day, trucks stretching a half mile waiting to dump their corn. One farm official told me farmers here are more conservative, generally older than the wheat farmers who organized and carried out the strike in Colorado and Texas today. Jack Scott says he sympathizes with the strikers, but says they're not going to do any good. He says that prices must go up or... Well, I'm afraid we won't have any young farmers. But dissatisfaction now does not spell strike. I'm Mike Walter at Large, WMT News Watch, Lynn County. The new Biano Dam, which is cutting Panama's oil imports. Seven countries provided subcontractors to build the Biano Dam. The Yugoslavs worked the concrete and the Japanese put in the generators. We got there just as the generators were being installed. Uh, the last of which I was the commander of the Atlantic Center. Santa Claus. Thank you, Jackie. Okay. Colonel, were there any parts of the treaty, you were heavily involved in negotiations, were there any parts of the treaty that you would have liked to have seen uh, hammered out either more strongly or not quite so strongly? Are you totally satisfied with the treaty? We have a treaty which uh, in all respects meets the requirements of the Department of Defense as well as uh, the general interest of the United States. Let me give you an example. The neutrality treaty. Uh, the one that runs indefinitely and provides the operating rights for our naval vessels as well as our commercial vessels uh, on into the indefinite future, was written in the Defense Department. Uh, we drafted the treaty. Uh, the most uh, operative part of it, uh, which provides for the general uh, nature of uh, the regime of neutrality, as we call it, the set of rules for the canal's operation, uh, were personally drafted by the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, we worked on it and gave it to the negotiators, and we said, this is what we really want. And after we had some uh, exchanges on it and they finished negotiating it, the only difference between what they came out with and what we gave to them initially were improvements that they made over our own draft. Okay. If, have you been having a lot of these speaking engagements, and if, if so, are you kind of lobbying with the public for the treaty? We're responding to specific invitations uh, all around the country. Uh, we have more invitations in Washington for uh, personnel who are knowledgeable about the treaty and are, and are able to go out and, and speak to different public groups than we can possibly handle. So we're responding to specific invitations. Uh, in this case, uh, the World Trade Bureau in Des Moines, the, uh, uh, the Iowa Public uh, Broadcast Network, and then when we are here in the area, uh, we find that others would also like to hear about them. Do you think this treaty will be approved? Yes, I do. Uh, we see a shift in momentum uh, from uh, opposition to support. An example uh, was two weeks ago when a group of six senators, headed by Senator Byrd, visited Panama for three days. And they went everywhere in the country, talked to all kinds of people, including those who had voted against the treaty on, uh, in the Republic of Panama. On their return, Three of them announced their support for the treaty. The other three remain officially uncommitted. But we see a swing in uh, uh, support within the public as the facts are laid out, as the public understands more about what's actually in the treaties and what they do to protect U.S. interest. When we got the press release about your appearance here, there's a blue sheet of facts on it with it that said, do you know, and then it had several things listed. One of them was that Saul Linowitz is on the chairman of the board uh, on the board of the one of the banks to which Panama is heavily indebted and that 39 percent of the annual Panamanian budget goes to interest on loans alone. Now <laughs> that sounds like a conflict of interest that Linowitz would be negotiating the treaty and yet 
and the, the bank that he is on the board of is receiving interest from Panama. His, you know, do you have an answer to that? Yes. Uh, at the time that Ambassador Linowitz was appointed by President Carter to the negotiating team, he made all these facts known to the Department of State, and the legal uh, advisor in the State Department uh, uh, concurred that there was no real conflict of interest because of the negligible amounts in the overall category of loans involved in the Marine Midland Bank. Uh, when this uh, did become uh, an issue uh, subsequently with some members of the Congress, Ambassador Linowitz resigned from his directorship of the bank. Well, all right. That's about all the questions I have. Okay. A love triangle was the cause of the murder in Cedar Rapids that gained international headlines back in 1948. In fact, tomorrow is the 29th anniversary of the most famous killing in Iowa history. Mike Walsh at large reports. Room 729 of the Roosevelt Hotel was a blood-splattered mess December 14th in 48. Byron Hatman, an engineer, beaten up, stabbed in the heart, left lying in his blood. All evidence pointed to this man, a brilliant baby doctor from St. Louis, Robert Rutledge. The motive? Rutledge's wife, Sidney, a striking woman who, in the language of the day, was intimate with murder victim Hatman. Detectives like John Kuba traced Dr. Rutledge to the Montrose Hotel, decided a never-found Dr. Scalpel was probably the murder weapon. Kuba even discovered a bizarre note in Hatman's car trunk. Attached to chicken bones, it said chillingly, lest you forget. Cuba's picture and the case made virtually every paper in America and some overseas and appeared in 16 different detective magazines. The case had it all. Murder, sex, a Casanova, a jilted but proud husband who couldn't stand to see his wife run around. Former Sheriff Jim Smith guarded prisoner Rutledge, says he brought it on himself. He spent 18 hours a day at the hospital, so I was told. Then he'd be home for six hours. That six hours, he was interested in bugs and <laughs> cultures of different kinds and that sort of thing. He was no, no family man at all. Rutledge was found guilty, but released on bail. But when they refused him a second trial and sent a posse after him, he poisoned himself rather than serve time. Uh, did you feel sorry for him? Yes, I did. Uh, due to the fact that he was a young, brilliant me medical doctor, and his career just went down completely down the drain because of a woman that was false to him. The paper accounts of the day said it was just like the movies, but it was real and the most publicized event in Cedar Rapids history, and it happened 29 years ago tomorrow. I'm Mike Walter at large, WMT News Watch, Cedar Rapids. A house in Cedar Rapids. Over the rock, then it was safe to run through the rapids. But when the rock was still sticking out of the water, then they knew they'd wreck their boat. And another man in Cedar Rapids who helped do a lot to start business, he ran a ferry service across the river. And when the rock was covered with water, then he knew it was okay to run his ferry across. And then he could also tell a little bit about how much he could take across. And then when the rock was sticking out of the water, he couldn't take as much, or sometimes he couldn't run at all across the river. So it was kind of a commercial gauge in a sense yeah. then, too. Uh -huh. um, so now what does this mean for this rock? Now that it's on the historic register, what, I mean, are they going to put a plaque on it? or? I'm not sure. I believe there was plans to put a plaque on it. I'm not sure if it has been erected or not, but I think there were plans to do that. It's just kind of a... Uh, a special designation for it. It's, it's just as an historic site. So I would assume now also that the rock is safe. <laughs> Nobody will be able to take the rock or blast it out of the water or anything like that. No, I believe it's going to stay there. <laughs> okay. When, um, you know, how does this, you did this for your Eagle Scout thing. Um, how does this make you feel, you know, do you feel, how do you feel? I'm, I'm happy. I really, I couldn't believe that it was even, you know, a rock in the river. Well, big deal, but it really got interesting when I started looking into it, and I'm really surprised that it even got approved. Okay. Okay. Well, I think that ought to
uh, take care of it. You're looking at one of the most accomplished con men of the year in action. A man who this winter convinced the Roosevelt Hotel in a number of Cedar Rapids banks and businesses that he's number 53, Jim Youngblood. Youngblood is now going to give Mr. Dickey a shot and a half. Jim Youngblood, starting outside linebacker for the L.A. Rams football team. At the Roosevelt, the man took part, in fact, took a swim. In this taping for a TV commercial, Newswatch obtained the tape to show you what it was like when William Wood, former Toledo, Ohio policeman, convinced all Cedar Rapids he was a pro football star. He acted like a football player. He acted like a man who liked people. He enjoyed being here. He talked with everyone. Uh, I don't think there was a person he didn't speak to. And for hours, just play with children, young boys, young girls, show them how to pass, play t football with them in the water. Just really a good time. And they thought it was great because they were playing football with the great Jim Youngblood. Of course they weren't, as a simple picture comparison shows. This is the real Jim Youngblood. How did the hotel people finally figure it out? Via bubblegum football card. <laughs> You're kidding. No. We, uh, we had the suspicion that he was not Jim Youngblood. And so we got in touch with some friends of ours and they had children and started looking through football cards. And sure enough, he was not who he said he was. So Lee confronted him, said, I know you're not young blood. He said, you're right. I'm an undercover cop and my life's in danger if you tell anybody. And so the con went on, on to Illinois, on to Milwaukee, where an arrest warrant awaits William Wood, and on to Nevada, where Wood was arrested and jailed recently for impersonating a Justice Department official. I'm Mike Walter at large, WMT News Watch, Cedar Rapids. I'm Maggie Jensen. Lake McBride is back in business. We'll take a look at the 4th of July celebrants. I'm Mike Walter. Hundreds of people take part in Iowa's biggest small town parade. We'll have a special report on that, along with a look at a Cedar Falls tombstone rubber. Maggie and I will have those stories, plus some helping hand advice for drivers. All on News Watch next. Thunder with the sports. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mike Walter. Dave Shea and John Bachman have a holiday off, and Maggie Jensen and I are sitting in for them. In the news tonight, Lake McBride State Park is literally bulging with picnickers and swimmers at this hour as the popular recreation area apparently is rebounding from extremely light crowds Saturday and Sunday. Park officials told Newswatch that today's crowd is about average for the 4th of July in sharp contrast to yesterday, described as the lightest holiday weekend turnout in recent memory. Park rangers say the beach and five parking lots were packed by early afternoon. And today's turnout would provide uh, some interesting information for a survey on the use of Lake McBride, a survey underway now. That survey for the Conservation Commission will show just how heavily McBride is used and how accurately park officials estimate that use. Rowdy campers at a couple. The biggest little 4th of July parade in Iowa. That's how Cedar Bluffs builds its annual 4th of July celebration. And Newswatch reporter Chuck Malloy says the town of 200 attracted thousands to this year's celebration. Normally, Cedar Bluffs is a small, quiet... That horse is bright. Maggie, a couple of Iowa City residents decided to celebrate the nation's birthday in their own birthday suits. That's right, the two were found sunbathing in the nude in the Iowa City Cemetery yesterday. The two were not arrested, their names haven't been released, but the nude bathers were ordered to put on their clothes and leave the cemetery. Coming next, a crowded Cedar River keeps the Lynn Sheriff's Department busy. We'll have a filmed report. And we'll preview a very important murder trial, so stay right here. Tim Fleischer, WMT News Watch on the Cedar River. Cedar Rapids police are looking tonight for thieves who stole a 1968 Plymouth station wagon and then drove it into Cedar Lake. 
the car owned by a New York woman was stolen from a hotel parking lot in the Quad Cities. It happened sometime between 10 last night and 4 this morning. The car was then driven to Cedar Rapids and dumped in the lakes. Arson is the suspected cause of a fire that destroyed a vacant home in Hiawatha late last night. The home is about a half mile south of Blair's Ferry Road and it had not been lived in for about 15 years. A resident at the Five Season Trailer Court told Hiawatha fire officials that he saw three youths running from that house just before the fire broke out. Fortunately, nobody hurt in that Hiawatha fire. Ten people have died room anyway. This week, the four biggest U.S. tire makers are going to be hiking their prices 3 to 5 percent. To help soften that blow, our helping hand, Tom Eisen, has some advice that can increase your tire's mileage up to 20 percent. No matter what kind of tires you have, a few simple and...